Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of RSMA, I welcome you to this important webinar. RSMA also thanks our moderators and faculty. RSNA is an accredited provider of CME and is offering CME for this event. Relevant disclosures are listed here. Today's 45-minute webinar is eligible for 0.75 Category 1 credits. RSNA is hosting today's webinar and has the following disclaimer. At this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. David Bloomkey, who is the editor of Radiology and one of our distinguished moderators today. Dr. Blumke, we are now making you the presenter. You may take it from here. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. David Blumke in Madison, Wisconsin. I'm the editor of the journal Radiology. Our seminar topic is preparing for COVID-19 in the radiology department. We've assembled an expert radiology panel with experience on the front lines like Seattle, but other departments also just gearing up for COVID. And from Singapore as well, more chronic ongoing experience with COVID for weeks now. Each panel member has been asked to express their top issues for COVID as it relates to their radiology department. After all the speakers, I'll turn the program over to Dr. Linda Moy to moderate. She'll do questions and answers with the panel. Dr. Moy is professor of radiology at NYU in New York. She's also our senior deputy editor for this journal, Radiology. I wanna let you know about our resource for the latest research about COVID-19. This is our website for the journal, Radiology. Click on the blue icon in the lower right for all key articles. All content is free. We have more than 120 images of COVID on CT and X-ray. You can page through all of the images probably in about five minutes. This is the first case reported in the journal Radiology of COVID-19 on January 31st, 2020. Outstanding CT quality. These pictures have been downloaded around the world more than 100,000 times. Prototypical CT findings are shown, usually bilateral, often posterior lungs. Ground glass opacities are common in early disease. There's subpleural sparing. The disease progresses rapidly. CT findings peak at days six to 11 after the onset of symptoms. But this seminar is not focused on diagnosis. Now countries outside of China are concerned with reducing the exponential rate of increase of COVID-19 infections. This process required about two months to control in China. The discontinuity in the graph on the left, that big jump, that's due to CT scanning. 10,000 new diagnoses added in one day in China based on CT. The health system in China became overwhelmed. Not enough RT-PCR test kits. The RT-PCR tests also had low sensitivity, 60 to 70%. China stopped formal diagnosis of COVID-19 with CT after about one week. No other place in the world is doing routine screening for, for COVID-19 with CT. But countries around the world are seeing exponential increases in the number of COVID cases, Italy shown on the right. This is the exponential increase in cases in the United States, the US only in about week two or three of this pandemic. China controlled the disease in two months by quarantine of 40 to 50 million people. We'll see what governments can accomplish after two months in, for example, Europe or the United States. Over the next weeks, your department will be faced with many challenges. Do you have a plan for staffing and supplies to continue your operations in a prolonged and ongoing emergency? You'll have many challenges. If your department is hospital-based, you have to help care for inpatients with COVID-19. But all of us must also provide for care for our normal patient populations, all of those chronically or critically ill with heart disease, cancer, or other conditions. How do we keep those patients safe and COVID-free? Let's move to our panelists. Dr. Carolyn Meltzer is our first speaker. Carolyn is Chair of Radiology at Emory and Vice Dean. Emory works closely with the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. Dr. Meltzer, we're going to pass the presentation to you. Uh, tell us about your main concerns and preparation that you're doing in your own radiology department. Great. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lumpke. I'm um, glad to be here with this wonderful panel today. There we go. So talking about our top priorities, we're at uh, Emory University in Atlanta, home of the largest, uh, busiest airport in the world. Uh, we have a very large population here, um, and our 
first priority is to ensure the health of our workforce. And in the case of the radiology discussion, we're having our radiology workforce. Um, what we are doing, especially now as we have more and more persons under investigation, uh, persons suspected of, of having a potential uh, COVID, uh, especially when they come through the ED, it's very hard for us to determine who may be positive or negative. If there's symptomatology, fever, cough, um, we put a mask on the patient, a surgical mask on the patient. If the patient refuses, uh, a mask on our uh, providers, but we are concerned about um, shortages of PPE. We minimize uh, personnel in the room for procedures. This has been um, difficult to make some decisions about medical students, uh, observers, and um, many of our residents to be moved to remote learning. We limit the traffic in our reading room. We're making sure that we are distancing readers, solo assignment of workstations, um, cleaning of those workstations between users and at the end of the day. And uh, we also have this handy sign um, that uh, is on our reading room doors. We have a lot of embedded areas of reading rooms and clinics uh, where we wanted our teams to work together and that was part of our model. But now we want to limit that uh, traffic in the reading room. So we're trying to encourage folks not to be coming in and out. Um, beginning on Monday, all of our non-clinical staff have moved to telecommuting. The university has uh, essentially moved everything to online learning, and our medical students um, are now in online learning. Research is now ramping down to all non-essential, non-critical on-campus research um, by the end of this week. And we are leaving in place certainly uh, clinical trials with active uh, patient care components, such as uh, uh, cancer trials, and some critical experiments around vaccine development. Uh, preparedness. Uh, so we've established a uh, COVID command center that is comprised of uh, our administrative and faculty leadership across the department. This is a very large department with uh, faculty uh, providers at seven hospitals and about close to 1,200 radiology um, staff and faculty and trainees across those sites. So we have a daily uh, command center huddle with the uh, Emory Healthcare System, twice daily um, department uh, command center huddles, daily summaries, uh, pushed out an email to the department and a weekly recorded town hall um, across all sites um, where we give updates and, and uh, we answer questions. Um, uh, we have to do PPE fit testing and, and check supplies. That is a, uh, a weak point and Zoom for all non-essential meetings. Pretty much all meetings, I should say. Um, so ensuring that we have the right radiology staffing to cover everything, we have moved and uh, are almost completed this week all screening examinations, so mammography, lung cancer screening, uh, CTC, et cetera, calcium, uh, cardiac uh, calcium scoring, and non-urgent emergent imaging and procedures postponed. The procedures are postponed on a two-week rolling reevaluation. Screening exams, we're rescheduling those for June. And then we're working with our clinician colleagues, uh, referring clinician colleagues, to evaluate particularly the patients who do still have urgent imaging or time sensitive. And uh, cancer imaging has probably been the, the area that's, that's most challenging to get right. Um, we've had uh, quarantines of uh, physician and non-physician staff with flu-like symptoms uh, or travel to a, a level three country, which is now no longer allowed. No, and we have a pretty complete travel ban at this point. We also have tried to track where everybody is at all times uh, to make sure that if we need to redeploy, especially staff who may have had um, non-urgent um, exams that don't have as much uh, scanning to do, to areas where they're needed. 
uh, we're working on deploying uh, home workstations, uh, especially those who are quarantined, have child care issues, um, significant risk factors. Uh, while we don't want to ask our colleagues about this, some have volunteered their concerns. So we have workstations uh, that are in for surge and disaster preparedness out um, uh, among our radiology workforce, but we have asked for expedited approval and gotten that for 30 additional ones, which are coming in a week. Never seen a large system move so nimbly. So, you know, at this time of great challenge, um, uh, decision making has been expedited. Our interventionists have really worked around, um, again, a similar sort of what's urgent, time sensitive, what is not needed at this time. We worry about nurses and anesthesiologists and are working closely with the, the surgery um, COVID team to prioritize and all elective procedures and elective surgeries have uh, stopped at this point. And we're also doing leader backup planning. So we all have critical roles. I've asked all of our leaders on the command task force, the command center to uh, provide their second in command, someone they will keep informed at every step of the way should they become uh, sick or quarantined. And again, planning for uh, changes in our imaging demands. Um, as uh, Dr. Blunke mentioned, CT is not, um, be ordered for the diagnosis of COVID and was used in uh, China for that purpose for a period. Uh, we are really trying to control that with radiologists just vetting and not having our technologists exposed unnecessarily uh, for diagnosis. As I mentioned, cancer care is, uh, is an issue. And our interventionists, again, high risk group, we want to rotate them out to refresh them. We're going to be really worried about the wellness of uh, those who are very much at the front line. Um, like everybody else, we have uh, concerns about PPE, uh, disinfectants, et cetera. We now, testing is a huge issue nationally. We now have an uh, in, internal Emory FDA approved COVID test that is up, up in running and we're prioritizing for our healthcare workers who are quarantined or symptomatic. Um, and, you know, standardizing our risk uh, mitigation and decontamination, uh, we're finding that we don't need to do a terminal clean every time uh, a patient who is potentially under investigation comes in. And we do have patients who um, we're calling FLIP. So they come in without uh, uh, consideration of COVID, but then uh, at some point in their hospitalization become a PUI or COVID positive. So we're doing a standard three minute wipe down of all patients and a terminal clean at the end of the day. We want to be able to prioritize certain scanners uh, where we can, but we're realizing that as they come in through uh, the ED at multiple sites, that may be difficult to do. Thank you so much. And now we will turn it over to Dr. Mosabasha. An experience in regards to COVID preparation. So um, in terms of our priorities, they focused on early detection, uh, limiting exposure to healthcare workers, employees, and patients, uh, appropriate screening of patients, imaging when needed and precautions taken, as well as staff protections and maintenance of radiology operations. In terms of radiology preparedness, so as we all know, Seattle was probably one of the earliest uh, hit areas in the U.S. in terms of uh, COVID-19, and so we've we've been going through this process for a little longer, um, and we've had the opportunity to kind of go through an iterative process to to develop our preparedness in this regard. 
Um, and this has really been a coordinated effort between the hospital uh, and departmental operation leadership, as well as multidisciplinary physician groups, including critical care, pulmonary emergency, radio emergency uh, uh, department, radiology, um, as well as a host of other groups. Uh, we've had a coordinated effort in terms of development of policies and guidelines, um, as well as standardized hospital-wide guidelines for patient care and hospital staff. We do have daily uh, radiology and hospital-wide uh, COVID-19 briefings, as well as briefings across the whole enterprise, which includes uh, uh, seven uh, hospitals, um, and in, in addition, multiple outpatient uh, clinics and centers um, and ambulatory uh, services. So in terms of early detection limiting exposures, uh, we have an automated patient texting uh, service uh, to communicate with patients. And with this service, what we've been doing is we've been reaching out to all uh, our outpatients and requesting uh, uh, rescheduling, especially focusing on those that are symptomatic, uh, those that are vulnerable, and those that are concerned about potential uh, risk. Uh, in addition, we've uh, postponed and rescheduled all lung cancer screenings, all mammograms, and all DEXA scans, uh, imaging that really doesn't you know, doesn't really have a, a priority in terms of timing. Um, and in addition, all elective, similar to, to the other institutions, all elective uh, invasive procedures uh, have been postponed um, out to, uh, we're, we're moving out to mid-April uh, to postpone those with the option at the beginning of April to consider moving it out even further. Uh, currently, in terms of access to the hospital, we have screeners at every hospital entrance. And uh, we're also performing screening at the radiology front desk in, the, in case anyone gets through. Um, and those symptomatic patients are rescheduled if they do not reschedule prior to their arrival at the hospital. So sometimes someone may slip through the cracks and may, dis may not respond and reschedule when they're text paged. Uh, uh, but in this way, we, we do it also on the front line. In terms of our screening of our, of screening of our patients, the PCR exam is something that our uh, lab medicine group started developing uh, right when the outbreak uh, occurred in China. And they were able to develop a very uh, sensitive and reliable exam. Uh, you know, initially, they were quoting numbers of 95 to 97% sensitivity. Now they feel that their test with continued sequencing of the RNA, that they're probably close to 100% sensitivity. Uh, initially, the turnaround time was eight to 10 hours when they were doing about 1,000 tests a day. Now they're at the point where they're doing about 2,500 tests a day with a turnaround time of 20 to 24 hours. So with that increased volume, that turnaround time has increased a little bit. We've never used imaging um, reg in regards to uh, screening for these patients. And the advantage of the PCR is it is less resource intensive. It's a more uh, sensitive and specific exam. In addition, there's less exposure risk uh, relative to imaging. We really reserve imaging for alternative diagnoses or urgent indications that will alter patient management. And in terms of where we perform the imaging, when we can, we try to uh, direct patients um, to uh, hospitals with or outpatient imaging centers with less critically ill patients and less foot traffic. And that's been a reality for us to where one of our outpatient, one of our uh, community-based hospitals that has 180 beds, about 30 of the hospitalized patients in that hospital are COVID positive and COVID related hospitalization. So we've certainly diverted services in different directions uh, to, to accommodate that. So in terms of uh, you know, protections for COVID, uh, positive or PUIs or suspected patients. Uh, for most patients, they're droplet and contact precautions. While those who are critically ill, who are coming who are ICU patients, or who are undergoing aerosol generating procedures, those are airborne contact precautions. I mean, there are slight differences in terms of in terms of that. And I'd be happy to discuss it at some other point. Uh, but in addition, we are implementing portable imaging when possible. And even to the point of patients who are COVID positive, they're maintained in glass uh, encased isolation room. I mean, we actually image through the glass. And the advantage of this is that there's less exposure to the healthcare workers. The only thing that goes in the room 
is a uh, is the cassette, um, and it requires less cleaning of the equipment. And here's just a flow diagram in terms of our uh, imaging workflow, focusing on the fact that there's no need for imaging uh, screening uh, for COVID-19 in emergent or in the setting of alternative diagnoses that would affect management. We try to do portable imaging first. Um, if that's not possible, droplet uh, contact precaution for most, uh, except for some that will require airborne contact uh, precaution. And the main focus is, will this imaging impact uh, patient management, uh, and that's something we really want the clinicians to keep in mind. This is a document that we shared with ambulatory clinics as well as the EDs to try and ensure uh, enforcement of this workflow. In terms of staff protection, uh, we have really focused on uh, reducing the number of patients that need to come to the hospital. Uh, off the bat, one of our hospitals implemented a physician and nurse team performing in-house testing. We, we have had drive-through employee testing for those that are symptomatic uh, uh, from early on. And we've also, with uh, collaboration with the Gates Foundation, the Seattle Flu Initiative, we've been developing and distributing home testing kits. In addition, uh, uh, similar to the other institutions, there is a moratorium on UW employee, faculty, and staff travel, and UW visitors for one month. Uh, in addition, any meeting with greater than six people, whether essential or non-essential, is virtual or canceled. Um, and we are focusing on social distancing greater than feet, six feet at all times. And this applies to reading rooms. This applies to uh, staffing of uh, fellows and residents. You know, generally, we try and maintain that space at all times. We are creating work home environments for those in quarantine. We've uh, ordered a lot of high resolution screens, which we are uh, actively distributing to faculty and helping them set up uh, workstations at home. Uh, most of the fellows are already equipped and about half our faculty are already equipped. So we're just building it out for the rest. Uh, we have set out outposts, isolated single uh, station reading rooms across our enterprise. Um, and so those are places where faculty who are concerned um, or uh, who potentially have vulnerabilities are allowed to go and work, um, and we've created sign-up sheets for those uh, reading rooms for people to for people to uh, take us up on. In addition, we are uh, uh, currently actively moving workstations into faculty offices to allow them to work in an isolated environment. Uh, all non-essential uh, for care staff are encouraged to work from home. Uh, in addition, uh, as I mentioned, our virtual uh, tr our trainee uh, staff outs are virtual, as well as we're having virtual consults with clinicians uh, via Zoom. And there's a lot of functionality there that can allow uh, both the trainee staffings as well as the virtual consults in that regard. Uh, we're providing the option for staff to use uh, uh, paid time off uh, during this time if they want to spend time with their kids considering the school closures or their concern for vulnerabilities. In addition, we're reducing uh, some of the staffing at our outpatient centers because of the significantly reduced volumes that we're seeing across the enterprise. Um, and we're giving residents um, on off, one week on, one week off, uh, due to the uh, limited need for coverage, as well as to allow them, uh, um, allow increased uh, distancing between uh, people. Um, and just a couple other things I wanted to mention are clinical trials across the board uh, for patients that are recruited from ICUs or EDs are all on hold. Um, and most of our other clinical trials that require uh, recruitment of patients are uh, on hold as well, although that's uh, elective uh, based on the studies that are being performed. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Dr. Mosabasha. Next, we have Dr. Kim. Dr. Kim, you are now the presenter. Hello, everyone. I hope everyone is doing well. So I'm representing NYU Langone Health. Uh, we are a large academic healthcare center in New York City. Uh, currently, we have over 1,300 cases in the state of New York. So there's been a rapid increase in the number of cases 
in New York City, we have over 450 positive cases of COVID-19 now. Uh, in this presentation, I would like to share with you a few of our top priorities for radiology preparedness. One priority is forming a crisis management team. I think forming a team is critical, mainly for directing the communication within the department. There are so many outside sources of information and opinions, uh, some of which may be conflicting. So it's important to have a uniform voice regarding what our policies and protocols will be. Uh, this information is then disseminated to all of the staff. Uh, the management team also plays a role in serving as a centralized resource for questions and concerns raised from members of the department. In this type of structure, the communication is more efficient and workflow can be standardized. So we mostly use regular conference calls and email communications. Another priority is implementing protocols for patients with known or suspected COVID-19. At the time of radiology scheduling, we screen for symptoms of fever, cough, and shortness of breath. If negative, we schedule the study. If positive, we direct them either to their primary care clinician, uh, a virtual urgent care visit, or to the ED. When patients present directly to an ambulatory care office, we also screen them for symptoms. Uh, if negative, we perform the study. If positive, we engage the clinician to determine whether, uh, determine the patient's disposition, uh, whether they're gonna be sent home to the urgent care or to the ED. We strive to take care of the patient, so we determine the urgency of the ordered examination for clinical management. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, if a symptomatic patient needs an MRI for a rotator cuff tear, we'll postpone that examination. However, if a symptomatic patient needs a CT scan for um, appendicitis, we'll go ahead and perform the examination. Uh, in reality, some of the examinations may be uh, in that gray zone and a little more difficult uh, to determine. The third priority is reducing potential transmission from known or suspected COVID-19 patients. Uh, here, the guiding principle is source control. Placing a mask on the patient as soon as possible greatly reduces the chances for transmission. At our ambulatory locations, patients are immediately screened, and if positive, they are immediately given a mask and isolated. Ideally, they are escorted to a separate room. Um, however, if that's unavailable, uh, we can partition off a section of the waiting room uh, as long as space permits. Our radiology providers wear appropriate personal protective equipment, including gloves, mask, and eye shield. If there is going to be close or direct contact with a the patient, then a gown is also worn. Also, when such a patient is isolated, we also take a census of other patients and staff in the office at that time so that they can be alerted should the patient test positive uh, in the future. For our ED patients and inpatients, they have usually already been identified and examinations are provided as clinically warranted. Uh, we dedicated a portable x-ray unit uh, to scan these patients. We try to perform these exams uh, in their rooms rather than uh, in the radiology department. Uh, for additional imaging, such as CT scanning, the radiology staff wears appropriate PPE and the room is cleaned and disinfected after use. Fourth priority is reducing potential exposure for department members. At our institution, any work-related or academic-related travel for a conference, a meeting, or a similar event has been banned for all employees for a temporary period of time. Personal travel and group gatherings are also discouraged. For our radiologists, we've reorganized some of the reading rooms to put more distance between the reading workstations. We're also expanding the use of home workstations, which can be used when covering non-teaching rotations uh, for academic time, and even if a faculty member is quarantined but still able to work uh, so, that they, so that we can meet the clinical demand. 
With the increased usage of PPE and the concern for shortages, we've instituted conservation measures to use them only when appropriate. Uh, we've also centralized the ordering of PPE and allocate these to the different offices based upon need. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Next to present will be Dr. Toot. Dr. Toot, you are now the presenter. Okay. So I'm going to uh, be focusing on differences between um, our uh, practice and some of the things that have been mentioned already. Uh, so our priorities, similar to other people, have been, you know, the shortages or potential shortages of um, masks. And so we've done similar things in terms of focusing who needs to use an N95 mask. And we've also stopped having the one-hour air exchange uh, for our CT scanners and just doing the three-minute wipe down like others have mentioned. Uh, we've also uh, practiced social distancing. Uh, one of the things we did was close our ED reading room since it was in the middle of the emergency room and there was shifts of people, radiologists uh, walking through the middle of the emergency room. Uh, the researchers and administrative staff are all working from home. Um, and almost all the sections have uh, formed cohorts where the radiologists work at only one site. Um, we've been lucky that we instituted home packs five or six years ago to help with uh, evening and weekend coverage. And so we've leveraged that by having uh, uh, people who are doing only diagnostic studies, uh, reading only diagnostic studies and no interventional procedures are able to work from home. Um, the, probably the biggest uh, issue that we've had was the idea of rescheduling non-urgent exams. Uh, just this past weekend, the uh, uh, chairs all got together and uh, the hospital leadership said we're going to need to uh, postpone and reschedule their clinic visits and their surgeries, um, but the chairs, other chairs spoke out and said we don't want our, uh, all our radiology procedures to be rescheduled without checking with us first. So that put us in a real, a real big bind. So two things have been happening. The uh, radiologists have been working with specialty leaders uh, within their area to figure out what indication study combinations uh, could be considered all non-urgent, and they've been rescheduling those. Uh, our rescheduling has actually been out six weeks, so we're rescheduling studies into May. And uh, we're actually currently sending out then an outpatient list of uh, the ones that aren't clearly non-urgent to the providers for them to review and get back to us. But in fact, just today, because we've had some slowdown in the schedules for both the radiologists and the technologists, we've started putting them in charge of uh, messaging through our EMR, these clinicians, to see if some of these ones that, that look like they're uh, non-urgent can be uh, rescheduled. Uh, other things that we've had to deal with, one is that the VA hospital here in Madison uh, has had a shortage of kits and they've open, opened a COVID-19 clinic for patients coming in with lower respiratory infections. Uh, and they are using CT because of the shortage of clinics to make the diagnosis. Uh, they think that's only going to be for a while until the, uh, the number of kits come back, but they are using that. Uh, at UW Hospital, um, we have tried to designate one CT room for lower respiratory infections or COVID-19 since they do get that full three-minute cavi wipe, uh, wipe down of the room uh, for at least using that for inpatients. But like others, occasionally a patient may get on the CT scanner down in the emergency room inadvertently. And we're still debating the role of two-view chest X-ray, uh, particularly on ED patients. Um, some of the ED physicians would like it, but we've actually instituted a policy with agreement from our ED leadership that we convert these all to a single-view chest X-ray. And if it doesn't show for some reason what they need, then in those cases, we would only bring those patients over for a two-view chest X-ray. And that's all I had. Thank you very much, Dr. Toot. Next is Dr. Coley. Dr. Coley, you are now the presenter. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to present a little bit of what we're doing here in San Francisco. We're in a six-county uh, 
shelter in place order and all schools are closed and things have really shifted rapidly um, in the last week. Um, so I recognize that every ecosystem is different, patient populations, health systems and departments. I wanted to try to bucket things that we are prioritizing and thinking about. Um, and so first, first and foremost is keeping our patients and uh, our staff and our faculty safe. Um, patient screening at our center has evolved. It began with uh, screening at ambulatory registration or ED registration. And thankfully, it's moved upstream. So it's really to entrance to buildings, um, hospitals and ambulatory buildings. And now in radiology, uh, all our procedural um, patients actually get a telephone call as well. So it's redundant screening at multiple levels. Um, and we're in instituting that now for diagnostic radiology exams as well. Um, you know, I think personal protective equipment supply is a concern for everyone at present. We have uh, an adequate supply, but we worry about this. And uh, the thing we are doing, I think, to write it, to make sure that we're using it pro properly is we've uh, created champions amongst faculty, staff, um, and trainees who are sort of in a train the trainer model so that we're making sure that everyone knows how to use this and when to use it. The algorithms have been rapidly evolving. Um, and then I think this question comes up of when do we image patients with known or suspected COVID-19? And uh, as the last speaker pointed out, this is really, you know, it depends on the local ecosystem. We did not have good testing capabilities early on. We have much better capabilities now. We really think that the imaging is uh, to look for alternate diagnoses. So when we do it portably in the ER with x-rays, uh, there is a question of whether early in the disease process when RT-PCR may be falsely negative, is there a role for CT? But we've worked with a multidisciplinary group um, to develop a clinical algorithm and really tried to avoid CT uh, in, in, in these patients when possible. And I think maybe the most important thing we did early on is work with our infection control folks um, on developing standard operating procedures for how to image these patients safely um, if they come to our department. Uh, so patients may have a PE, may have a dissection or a reasonable concern for those in a COVID positive patient. So how do we image these patients safely, prevent nosocomial infection or healthcare worker uh, exposure and infection? And so, I, you know, I think there's a, an important partnership there within systems to try to figure that out, what works for your system. But these are the sort of the, the, the interventions we focus on in terms of keeping patient interaction safe. Um, I won't say too much about social distancing and transmission prevention because I think uh, all speakers uh, have sort of indicated that everyone has moved towards really trying to keep everything remote whenever possible. Um, you know, a challenge is the alternative clinical work models for us. Uh, we do not have home pack stations and we are sort of one tip out there for the viewers here is I think many healthcare systems have emergency funds available specific to COVID and we're certainly applying to the, for those funds to try to get as uh, a rapid deployment as possible for true uh, high fidelity home workstations. Um, this, I think, has been also a big focus for us, has really ramped up in the last week. So many health systems probably have a tiered disaster plan. I gave you an example of how our health system has looked at this. You know, we'll be in different categories based on a few different um, sort of topics. What's the disease burden in our community and in our health system? What's our uh, capacity, both ambulatory and inpatient? And what's our workforce, uh, which may be increasingly challenging as we have schools that are likely to be out through the end of the year um, and healthcare workers, thankfully not turning positive at present uh, at a very at a high rate. We have six healthcare workers have all had community transmission of disease and self quarantines and no risk for exposure in the healthcare system. But we're worried about these things. Um, we've chosen to move with our health system along this. We're currently in the surge level red. Um, provided we continue to have existing resources within the department to provide such services. And just to give you an example, this is our interventional radiology where I practice. Uh, disaster plan is a piece of it. Um, when we get to surge level red, where we are currently, uh, we are committed to provide, providing inpatient care as per usual um, and to provide ambulatory care where a two to three month delay in that care could result in a worse patient outcome. And I've just given you an example of a table from that document that says, here's what we think we ought to be doing uh, based on this timeline. And here are the cases we should be rescheduling or postponing. Um, and so we, we're trying to apply that across the board. Obviously, for diagnostic radiology, as other speakers have mentioned, there's a lot of um, 
interaction that has to occur with the treating physicians to try to understand who fits in this bucket and who really needs, uh, who can be delayed. The other things we have tried to do is uh, cohort our care teams and cohort our patients, I should add. So as an example for IR, um, we have uh, closed one of our outpatient sites. We've cohorted down to two sites. Um, and in those sites, we have actually, so there's two teams of IR, and that includes everyone. So that's the physicians, that's the advanced health practitioners, practitioners, our technologists, and our nurses. Um, and even within each site, we have sort of Monday, Wednesday, Friday, one team, and Tuesday, Thursday. And the concept there is if one of these teams um, becomes infected and a vector for the entire team, we still have three-fourths of our interventional radiology team available. Um, and so I think you know, we're trying to push that out to everyone who's patient-facing um, and really even our diagnostic radiologists eventually. But uh, as we are the most patient-facing, we're sort of, I think, at the leading edge of this. Um, and uh, I should also mention cohorting patients is, I think, also critical. So we're really trying to separate our inpatients and our outpatients um, wherever possible. Uh, and, you know, this is a time of high anxiety. And uh, I think effective communication and nimble response is really critical. Um, these are some of the steps we've taken. We have a daily 8 a.m. managers teleconference that also includes MD leadership. We've got a daily uh, COVID-19 response team that's department specific. All these, of course, take place via Zoom. Um, we've set up uh, specific WhatsApp groups for rapid communication amongst the teams that need to be talking to each other. Each section has got its own WhatsApp group. Every morning, the section chiefs uh, update a roll call, and at the end of the day, they receive an update of the volume. We have seen about a 40% tick in downturn in volume. A lot of that is actually patients self-canceling their, their appointments. Um, so that we can match our sort of resources to the demand. Um, and then I'll be stepping out just a little bit early to, we're gonna host our first department town hall to try to uh, share information and also uh, take questions. Um, and we've set up a department website. This is behind a firewall, but I was talking with my chairman about maybe we ought to put this, um, make this public and vet what's on there first um, to really make it so that it's not just push information, but you can, people can pull information about what we're doing in radiology specifically uh, to address this uh, anxiety provoking situation. And thanks, that's all I've done. Thank you so much, Dr. Coley. And our final presenter will be Dr. Tan. Dr. Tan, you are now the presenter. Thank you. I hope you all can hear me. And uh, just like to thank uh, Dr. Bloomkey for inviting me to this uh, webinar. I think it's a privilege to participate. In Singapore, we are eight weeks down the road with uh, COVID-19. We had the uh, misfortune of being hit quite early because of our being so close to China but the fortune of not being overwhelmed as it is. So one of the things we quickly did was to constitute a more nimble radiology disease outbreak task force leadership group. Um, we specifically sought out colleagues who have experience with intense operations, uh, we are fortunate to have people who held senior position in the armed forces, and they work at a different pace, and they've added a lot of value to our group. I'm not going to repeat many of the good practices that have been shared uh, by the previous speakers, but this small group meets uh, daily for a short 20-minute uh, meeting to assess overnight changes and anticipate changes during the day. Uh, we make sure that we are very much a part of the institutional outbreak task force as well. And one um, real benefit is that we've inserted ourselves very closely with our infectious diseases clinical team. So we get information real time. We help organize imaging if that's needed 
uh, for more timely diagnosis and make sure that we prevent nosocomial infection. I think the key now, eight weeks down the road, is to ensure we have a sustainable radiology operations. Um, the key for us is that every single staff member must be competent and we need to be watching out for fatigue and complacency at this point of time. One um, thing we did differently with regards to our reporting workstations, reporting areas, which was very much subspecialty based was that we reconfigured them into multi subspecialty reporting teams to prevent uh, huge uh, teams being down with quarantine. And uh, we are seriously looking at implementing social distancing beyond during work hours. Um, we realize that during break times, staff from multiple departments do come together. You've seen how China has been very successful with social distancing strategies. And uh, this is how I usually have lunch every day now. I take a very early lunch at 11 a.m where no one is around, but we're trying to move this to try and educate all staff within the hospital to adhere to this policy. We are also keeping an eye on long range planning because, you know, this could signal a new norm for the way radiology departments operate. I think we need to inculcate a culture of infection control practice that's embraced by all staff members. So it's not just during a disease outbreak, but every single day. I think this is a great opportunity to rethink how radiology should deliver optimal imaging and intervention. Because we are a large hospital campus, we're looking at how we can reduce unnecessary movement and congregation of patients within our hospital environment. And we're moving, as many of you have shared, into teleconsultation, electronic smart appointment applications and counseling. Uh, I have to say that, uh, you know, prior to this outbreak, we were not very advanced in doing all this. So I would urge that as we struggle with the crisis, keep an eye on the long term impact of our future practice and uh, never lose this opportunity in a crisis like that. Thank you very much. Take care, keep your distance and stay safe. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Tan. I will be turning the presentation over to Dr. Moy to moderate the Q&A session. Uh, please remember that you can open the chat window at, by using the speech bubble icon at the bottom of your window. And please make sure to set it to send uh, your comments to all panelists. So, Dr. Moy, you now have the presentation ability. Wonderful, thank you. First, I want to inform the attendees that we are going to um, extend this session to 4.15. And if you have any uh, questions, please use the chat box to answer them. Okay, so this is the first question I'd like to pose, which is how do we keep the CT scan room safe for other patients? The lengthy air exchange and terminal cleaning will significantly limit the number of CTs that may be performed. And I'm gonna ask Dr. Kim to answer this question first, please. Thank you. Sure, so I think the important criteria is whether the patient is masked or unmasked. Uh, if the patient is masked, um, there, uh, a disinfectant wipe down of the scanner is performed and then the scanner can be immediately used. Uh, if the patient is unmasked, or the mask comes off during the exam, uh, then if it's a negative pressure room, uh, the scanner can be wiped down and used immediately. Uh, if it's a positive pressure room, um, it's wiped down and then uh, we place a HEPA filter into the room and wait an hour just to be very conservative uh, before using the scanner room again. Does any other panelists want to answer this question? 
Yeah, so um, just a, a quick, uh, just our experience at UW and in interacting with infection control, they have maintained that um, radiology visits are considered transient visits or ambulatory visits. And for that reason, air exchange is not needed um, in any circumstance for imaging, whether the patient is droplet or uh, airborne precaution. Uh, we do keep the patients masked and we, do a, we don't do a terminal cleaning. Uh, we do a, uh, a you know, purple top uh, wipe down or a cabicide uh, wipe down, uh, but no need for environmental services to clean it all up. I mean, we don't close the room for any length of time. Okay. It seems as though most of the speakers are using a three minute wipe down after each patient. Is that a fair statement from our panelists? Uh, this is Carolyn uh, Meltzer, similar at, at Emory as well with the patient mask. Hi, this is uh, Bian Su from Singapore General. Um, we've actually limited CT scanning on patients with COVID-19 for mainly uh, problem solving. So we've only done just a few cases. And in these cases, these patients were intubated and very ill. So it is actually, uh, we do more than that. Uh, we, we do wipe down terminal cleaning, UV light. Um, so the challenge is that the turnaround time for a single case like that just takes a few hours. So uh, we go the whole uh, of, of cleaning. Okay, thank you. With that, I'd like to move on to the next question. Uh, can you advance the slide, please? And this is concerning supplies, which a few of our panelists have raised. So it's a two-fold question. First, if the epidemic continues and disinfectants become short in supply for cleaning, radiographic equipment, and waiting areas, what type of alternate disinfectants or cleaning procedures would be advised? And also, what protective devices would you use for technicians in performing exams on asymptomatic or low-risk COVID-19 patients and if those protective devices are in short supply, what would your recommendations be? So um, in terms of the alternative disinfectants, um, there's a list from the Environmental Protection Agency of 274 different agents that are approved uh, for, uh, for dealing with coronavirus, the, the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, uh, um, so there's certainly an abundance of types of cleaning materials. Certainly, these are all in high demand, but there are options. And for us, uh, you know, we first go with the purple top wipes, uh, which are approved for this purpose. Um, and But as those have become uh, uh, reduced in resource, a uh, reduced resource, we have the option of using cabicide, which is much more abundantly available. Um, in terms of uh, protections for asymptomatic or low-risk COVID-19 patients. These are kind of slightly different uh, categories because for us, uh, in talking to the ED, generally they try to cast a wide net uh, for uh, COVID-19 patients. So say the, one example is the cancer patient who's had a, a history of a cough, but suddenly that cough worsens a little bit. Should that be a suspected COVID-19? It's probably fairly low likelihood. But to be safe, they end up putting those into the rule out COVID category. And so we treat them as such. And in that situation, they go to droplet precaution. We treat all suspected COVID-19 patients the same. So in that setting, it's droplet and contact precaution. Asymptomatic patients without risk of COVID uh, is a different category. And while there is a likely a high proportion of exposed people or infected people that are asymptomatic, as of right now, we don't employ uh, protection, PPE in that setting. We have discussed having the ultrasound text use surgical masks for all those uh, cases. In terms of short supply and how to approach, we are, uh, looking, we are looking at that. Tomorrow we have a meeting uh, with uh, epidemiology providing modeling of what'll, how long we expect our supplies to last and what alternatives are as our PPE runs out. So hopefully we'll have a little more information Thank you for that. Yeah. Any would any other panelists like to respond? Uh, for 
goggles and masks, uh, we are actually uh, having uh, folks who are in research labs um, uh, bring those over. They have them. We've also gotten devices from Home Depot for face shields. So trying to have all hands on deck for pr protective devices. Thank you. With that, I'd like to move on to the final question. We advance the slide, please. I'm sorry, one more. So this final question is, what is the current weakest point in your plan? Are there any opportunities to address it? I'd like to start with Dr. Tu, and I think it'd be helpful for the, all the panelists, since we all have different healthcare ecosystems. Sure, Linda, I can uh, start. Well, I think the weakest point that I feel like we have would be if we have too many uh, radiologists who uh, become sick and ill uh, within one section within our academic medical center. Um, you know, I think we've done a lot to try to mitigate that by, um, you know, having cohorts of people working at different sites so that we don't have a single, you know, infected patient or, or uh, staff member infect the entire division. Um, and, uh, and so I think by doing that and taking advantage of the fact that we have this robust home packs, and so we're having a lot of the radiologists who are doing diagnostic studies only being able to work from home. But we do have a lot of rotations even besides IR where people have to be on site in a hospital or one of our imaging centers to be able to do some procedures. And uh, that's, I think, is going to be our weakest point that we're working to prevent from happening. Thank you, Dr. Coley. Hi there. You know, I would echo that my biggest concern is our, uh, well, I would say even our patient-facing staff and physicians. Um, you know, we're in an area where the community uh, transmission is real where uh, PPE shortage may become real depending on the length of this epidemic. And we have seen patients sort of um, not really truthfully respond to screening. Um, and so, you know, we can do a lot with cohorting, et cetera, but, uh, you know, I worry about us getting to a point, the whole health system really getting to a point uh, where we can't provide standard of care for patients who do have time urgent needs. Um, you know, I think we're all probably struggling with that, but that's my greatest concern. And Dr. Tan? Thank you. Um, you know, despite being eight weeks into this outbreak, um, we are well coordinated nationally. So we haven't gone into a lockdown situation, which I'm seeing in some of the cities around the world. So one of our greatest concern at work is what I've touched on that uh, it's not just radiology staff, but the whole hospital staff coming together at break times and meal times. So we're working very hard on social distancing so that uh, we try and really minimize the risk of any one of the staff getting infected to community exposure and then bringing it back into our hospital environment. So that's what we are working on now. Thank you, and Dr. Meltzer? Uh, thinking system-wide, um, shortages of uh, uh, protective equipment, shortages of ventilators should uh, uh, we increase the number of patients uh, in our system, anesthesiologists who are at high risk uh, doing intubations and aerosolization, um, they, then that cascades down to interventional radiology they're also frontline, uh, our technologists. So I also worry very much about the, the workforce and um, our systems being overwhelmed. Most of our hospitals function at a very high um, uh, bed capacity, filled bed capacity um, most of the time. So uh, even as we clear out as many non-urgent patients, um, they will still, um, uh, potentially bounce back for other things while we have uh, growth in the number of COVID patients. Thank you. 
at the Mosa Basha? Um, I think one major concern for us is um, is uh, workforce morale. Um, I think people are afraid of exposures, especially when you think of the techs and frontline workers. As Carolyn mentioned, people are stretched thin, um, and uh, just making sure that leadership is supportive um, and, and working towards uh, keeping that morale up. Thank you, and Dr. Kim. Through supplies, and uh, our staff are getting concerned about exposure. So um, I think that's our greatest concern right now that we have enough supplies to protect our patients and our staff. Okay. Thank you. Well, this is the last question I'm going to ask. I'd like to thank all the panelists for their expertise. I found the session to be very helpful. As we said, the session is recorded and will be on YouTube. And I'd like to thank all the attendees for um, for signing for the session. And I hope that this rapid uh, spread of information will help us all taking care of the patients in this pandemic. Thank you very much. This concludes this webinar. Thank you again for attending today's webinar.